two and a quarter. And welcome to the Glacially Musical Podcast. It is beer, metal, swearing, YouTube review, some vinyl. I, of course, am Nick Cameron of Glacially Musical. I am joined by my good friend and co-host, the strongest man in San Francisco right now, Kifi Chikara. I don't feel like it, but thank you for that glow up, my friend. Uh, Chikara is uh, Spanish for strength. Or, excuse me, Japanese for strength. Oh, I did not know. I did not know. That is also the pronunciation of the symbol Kiss puts on all of their shit. No shit. Yes, that means ch uh, Chikara, which means strength. Anywho, uh, thank you for uh, anybody joining us on the YouTubes because we've been seeing a lot more of you lately. Thank you. If you don't want to hear talk, let me give you some logistics. Here's how the Glacier Musical Podcast works. I give the introduction, which you've already heard. Then we, well, we already said, how you doing? So we did that. Then we do beer check. We do a vinyl check. Uh, we Then we wrap about some news. Then we get to it. So if you just want to hear about today's subject, Motley Crue, Theater of Pain, skip ahead about 20, 30 minutes and you will find out. In the meantime, I'm going to beer check because Hell I am yeah. because I am basic as shit. Sticking with my Duvel tulip glass. It's a gorgeous glass, though. Yeah, it's it's for uh, Duvel Belgian ales, but it works so great for strong IPAs. I am kicking it with a Stone IPA, the granddaddy of the American IPAs and the class of the league, if you ask me. It is a 6.9% ABV hoppy as hell tastes kind of like a two by four and you, look if you look at my screen you can see that the top of my can is almost to my microphone to give you an idea of the kind of day i've had nice pop here it comes and also the, the duvel glass also is 16 ounces no shit so if i do a shitty pour which i did not do today oh that looks real good buddy uh -oh. Unless it goes uh -oh. over. It's going over. There we go. Beautiful. Beautiful looking beer, though. Oh, it's a gorgeous... It's a gorgeous looker. And it's uh, just got it... Shoot, like the Millennium Falcon, <clears throat> it's got it where it counts. Hey. I have not had a beer since before I had COVID. At, before I caught COVID, which is technically before July 4th, because I started to get sick over that weekend. And I was like, no, nah, I don't feel like any beer. I feel crappy. So the, the sh when I pre-game that I went to the show that I caught COVID at, which is all my fault because I had the wrong fucking mask, I am having my first, this, these beers have been in my fridge for three, three and a half weeks. Um, that being said, here is some Peak Organic Brewing IPA. Mm -hmm. I have had, I have had these, of course. I have a glass, holy shit, a glass is waiting. That is the bar of this of this podcast. Is there a is there a glass for beer? I didn't warn you about the pop. I was excited. I have I have. You didn't need to warn me. I, I I'm watching. I didn't have a beer in a long time, so this is some exciting shit for me. My peers are uh, my pores have been not peerless. They've been poor, but this one's also meh. But whatever. Look, as long as the beer gets in the glass and then in your face hole. There it is. Cheers, my friend. Cheers, buddy. I'm glad you're feeling better. Thank Oh, that is a... Let me see that. That is a... Awful. <laughs> that's a hazy motherfucker, isn't it? it is, it's not billed as a hazy, but it is... See, I've had... It tastes fruity like a hazy, so... Mm, got that citrus. Mm. And if I could just briefly say, uh, Keefe, when he had COVID, felt like shit and was smart. I had COVID and I felt fine and I was stupid. I drank no water during my quarantine. I drank yeah. beer and mount beer, Mountain Dew and coffee for five days. I am still waking up daily. I'm I'm thirsty and miserable. If you catch that reference, is a hardcore punk reference. But like, no. I am often thirsty, and I have been dehydrated and fatigued. Those are the lingering things. I'm still dehydrated. I was horribly feverish and dehydrated during the entire Rona run and I'm still very dehydrated. I normally don't drink stuff like Gatorade, but I have been drinking it by the fucking boatload. Um, it's nice to have a beer come across my face for the first time in a minute. I, I drink a lot of water and eat every day anyway and coffee and seltzer. I have a seltzer here when my beer runs out. 
ready to go. So, you know, it is one of those things. Just uh, I, uh, I, I, com- I completely hear you. Everybody take care of yourselves. Be Please. careful. Please take and, care of uh, But now the vinyl check for the week. You go first. All right. I got a, I got a pair that I'm going to pop out for you. So got a pair. first one. <laughs> Oh, Corner nice. head games. Got to be honest, this cover is a little problematic. <laughs> Every album cover in that era is problematic, my friend. Why is this uh, 15-year-old wearing very little clothing, a uh, 15-year-old lady wearing very little clothing and sitting on a urinal? None of that makes sense. All of that is kind of gross. Uh, this is, of course, an original. This is not a reboot. Mm. Like Wife is a big Foreigner fan, so on a shopping spree recently ahead went ahead and picked it up trying to get a good look through the label but i uh, got this one for the princely sum of five dollars it has been cleaned but it has not been put into the mylar yet so give me two seconds to put this one away and i'll pop out the next one out of curiosity next. what's on there what are the highlights of that album well it's got head games of course uh dirty white boy Head Games, Blinded by Science. Uh, I'm not a big fan of Foreigner, so... I know the hits, like everybody else, so I don't know what album they're from. I just know, you know, the big, big ones. Correct. My next album is going to be very different. This one is from 2022, because I can't help myself, even though I got, even though I sold every other album by them I owned, because it got too expensive, so this is a rental, probably as well. The latest Coheed and Cambria record, Vaxis 2 or some shit like that. I don't know. It's uh, Goofy. Vaxis 2, Electric Boogaloo. I had to jump in on that. Go uh, ahead. You go ahead. This is a quintuple goofiness. Uh, it is a cool color, though. Also cleaned, not put in mylar. Comes in a nice sleeve, lyric sleeve. And... And I have to say, this is a really, really good record. And I am very happy with it. I got this off of Amazon. I'm glad to see that Amazon is starting to get colors now. For the longest time, when I would order anything off Amazon, it would be just black. When, because I, I ordered off, I would always order off Amazon because I had Prime, hmm. you know, save that six bucks and get it faster. But it was always black, all black, black, black. So it's cool to see that. It's a really great record. I am, I'm a mid-grade Coheed fan, I guess. You know, I'm, like I said, it's a rental. Coheed fans are crazy when this gets up to 150 that, bucks. That variant is sold out. You will be able to move that sucker when you're done enjoying it. Uh, I am also a Midland Coheed fan. Respect them, like them, mm-hmm. love Claudio, met him oh, and yeah. his wife, love the comic books, love the prog Kohi, they tried one alternative rock album that was just garbage to me. I know. Oh, color and the that's shape. That's fighting words. I think that's Foo Fighters, is it? Um, I think that's fighting words to Kohi fans who think everything they do is incredible. Big color diehard. and the shape was it was it was okay. <laughs> that one uh, I sold after man one, after man two for a hundred and a quarter a piece. Mind you, I paid fifteen a piece for them. Mm. Uh, yeah, I really should start buying two of them and just. And, I hate flippers, but maybe I'm just going to become one because people do it. Sometimes it's, I I tell you the, uh, we'll save it for the music news, but flipping sometimes you could just see it developing when a new album is announced and you see the merch just immediately go cold and sold out immediately. You can be like, oh, these are going to be astronomical on the resale market. Um, well, one of the things that I, I tell people about buying vinyl in, in the 2020s Basically, you can buy a record on Amazon when they're clearancing it out for 15 bucks, hooray for boobies, and then sell it for 100 in two years. Or more if you held it longer, for sure, yeah. Yeah, I sold hooray for boobies this year for 75 yeah. bucks. I That's spent, amazing. I got it for $15 because it got to the point where I'm like, wow, this is too expensive for me to hold on to when mm. you know I could use this to buy groceries for a week. Yeah, and I don't... And I don't listen to it anymore. So, because, I mean, I don't know if you've heard those songs. Yeah, uh, yeah, except for the couple. They're not, it's not, they're not, yeah. Um, it's got three good songs on it. 
and then it's got like and the, all the songs that are good are really really wrong that i don't want my kid hearing me listen mm. to no did you know did you know do you know do you know bbc radio much or bbc presents and things okay so bbc ghost cult is an international website with roots that started in europe and we do a lot of hey you know slipknot played the bcc the bbc and this and that and made a veil studios and things so daniel carter daniel p carter who is a presenter on bbc for their rock radio one rock show the big he's the jose mangan the eddie trunk of you know western europe i think that's fair he's great he actually briefly wrote for ghost cult before i showed up in it and took it over Hmm. uh he was a touring guitar player at the end of of that band just so you know he was that's that's like his byline is i played on tour with that band and then i went to bbc radio Bloodhound Gang? Yeah, Bloodhound Gang. <clears throat> so, oh, just... Okay. The more you know, you know. Uh, you Is that your vinyl check? Are you all That's done? That's my vinyl check. I'm done. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come with mine, and in the spirit of the Rona Tales of Kifi, here's an album I picked up at that show, Darkest Hour, Toxic Holocaust, and Darkness Everywhere. Uh, I'm going to try to do something where I actually have enough vinyl. Not that anything's... I'm not buying a lot of new stuff, but stuff is showing up that I I bought earlier in the year. And I have picked up enough other things that I can have different vinyl across my different mediums. So here's one I haven't had anywhere else. And this is the Municipal Waste Toxic Holocaust Split EP that I picked up at that show. Uh, It is pretty amazing. Toxic Waste, uh, appropriately. Um... The bands do have very similar logos. It's kind of funny and similar vibes. Speed metal and punk on the back. And then there's a waste side for municipal waste and a toxic side. Uh, and it's pretty rad. It's pretty thrashing. But it has, this is what suckered me in for $20, the princely sum of $20 that goes directly to the band with no shipping charge for me since I got yeah, it. I have show. a hard time spending 20 bucks on an EP though. Well, I don't think about it like that. I think about how cool this thing is technically going to be out of print soon. It's rare to have. They don't have thousands of them. And this is, so look at this beauty. This is kind of like the bird shit splatter. Mm. The bird shit pattern, if you will. But it's uh, it's pretty fucking dope. And it does go perfectly thematically with both bands. Uh, Toxic Holocaust has kind of a puke green logo and municipal waste has a yellow one or they both do so like i don't know this vinyl is gorgeous plays pretty cool it's a 45 on a on a yeah. on an EP. an ep yeah so the quality's good um joel grind for those that don't know also produces albums and remixes and remasters albums so if he had a hand in making that thing you know it's gonna sound pristine very cool so that is my vinyl check uh see all right well, we got uh beer check vinyl check news of the week i'm gonna throw out that uh <clears throat> cannibal corpse dark funeral immolation and somebody else because it doesn't matter it doesn't matter because they're not coming to town yeah uh they are playing two shows in northern illinois i uh now in fairness i have seen cannibal corpse uh multiple times already i don't know that i would go but I would like to see Immolation again. Uh, gonna throw out that Telekinetic Yeti out of the Des Moines, Iowa's is on tour. I did a review of their debut and I believe only album. So no, they've got a they got a, they have a brand new album out. I haven't heard it yet. Uh, I did a vinyl review of their their first one. Some Pump Records sent it to me. They actually contacted me about them, saying, "Hey, we've got this out this band coming that we think you're gonna love." and Oh my god, if you like doom metal, like I like doom metal, where it's just thunderous and crazy and slow, these are your boys. I love Telekinetic Yeti. I'm so happy to see them. And just I got one more thing and I will shut up about news. Uh speaking of doom metal, Clouds Taste Satanic are teasing a new record. So great, I get to spend more money on Cloud's Taste Satanic. Yay! Word if, you like your, if you like your doom metal long and without all those extraneous words, there you go. There I you have go. the last 
four, I think. And then, a, I don't know, I have, I have five or six records by them. I have lost count. So here's, a, here's an idea, and I've floated this before. Is since we can't both go to Cannibal Corpse, I don't think they're coming here either, or they are when I'm not here. Um, Napalm Death has announced the tour, similarly, Ooh. with Brujaria and different opening bands on different legs of the tour. One of these tours will come to both our cities where we can hit them alternately within a few weeks of each other and do a chaser review of a show together that we both saw in different cities. It might be cool. You have not floated that or I drank too much. I may have could, floated it, but yeah. Could go, it could go either way. It I could have drank that away. It but yes, happen. I would be down for that. I think that would be a really cool, really cool chaser. I have seen both those bands within the last seven months and they were both awesome. I have um, not seen Napalm Death since the Slayer Farewell. Oh, yeah. Uh, Napalm Death, Slayer, Testament, and Lamb of God. <clears throat> Three quick pieces of news since you brought up Slayer. Carrie King is oh, on the verge right. of releasing new music under his own banner, which may or may not be called Blood Rain. We don't know yet. That's the LLC he filed for when he lived in Vegas. He now lives in New York with his wife who's awesome if you follow her on Instagram and stuff, TikTok. Um, Paul Bostaff is the drummer, long rumored to have Gary Holt on guitar and Phil Anselmo on vocals. I think Phil's going to be busy doing something else, as we've been discussing. Um, thoughts on Kerry King finally coming out with some probably Slayer sound and new music? All right, I'll just, I'll just throw it out there. Uh, I, as of today... I have little to no interest. Um, Carrie King has always been, and I love Slayer. I love Carrie King. It's like, it, it's kind of like a Yannick solo record to me. Uh, he would have to play to make a record. Oh, hey, he probably plays <laughs> something. Uh, I like Carrie King, uh, but I mean, the problem I have with Slayer is Slayer is. In my humble opinion, number three out of the big four. And they're only up to number three because I don't like Anthrax. So the problem with Slayer is unlike Metallica and unlike Megadeth, you have to listen to them at ear-piercing volumes to make it good. But at ear-piercing volumes, it's amazing. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I like Paul Bostoff. Gary Holt, I do enjoy some Gary Holt. Who would play bass? That's a different question. That's another question. But I mean, it basically sounds like he's doing Slayer, Slayer just. He but said it will sound something like Slayer because it's him, but will be different than Slayer somewhat. But I mean, Gary Holt isn't exactly. I mean, he was on one Slayer record. It didn't. Yeah, but he didn't get to write. Really, he didn't. They didn't really unleash him and let him write, which they should have the whole way, because he's one of the greatest writers in thrash history. He's a better writer than Kerry King. I might arguably be with you on that. Um, but then again, again, I think Slayer's awesome. Slayer rules. No, Slayer is awesome. Kerry, Slayer you know, Tom is... is retired and probably not doing anything except guesting, guest yelling on people's records once in a while. You know, I, I, I don't see him making a record ever again. I want to see Slayer stay retired for one <clears throat> reason and one reason only. One, I want somebody to do a farewell tour and mean it. Because no one has ever done a single farewell tour. So far. <laughs> not right. really. Not Ozzy, not Priest, not Slayer. You know, Slayer, there so were, far, not crew. There were, there were two. Now there's one. And so far, it's only Slayer. Hmm. And Slayer is probably the band that would do a farewell tour and mean it. Aisha King has said repeatedly now, there is no chance in hell, pun intended, that Ooh. they will ever, that to Carrie and Tom... We'll barely get in a room together, probably, let alone make music and tour ever again. There is no more Slayer coming. Yeah, Tom, well, Tom ended Slayer. He didn't want to do it anymore. He wanted to retire and do nothing. That well, he was wanted his, to retire his, years ago. Years ago. He, I mean, like, he probably has as many physical problems as Mustaine or Jason Newstead, like from neck surgeries and just, just you know, tired. Well, of, dude, 40 years or something is a long time, man. And when you have a head of hair like he does, he's like a Klingon up there. <laughs> he is. He's got, I just he's think got, he's like the one guy in Slayer with a family. 
he's the one guy in Slayer. Like, he had stakes in the game to walk right. away. And he, he was ready to call it a day. And you know what? There is nothing wrong with that. Slayer mm -hmm. has an amazing history, an amazing career, an amazing catalog of music. They, he he's climbed the mountain. He's done everything. So, if Tom Araya wants to rest and enjoy, he's in his sixties. Let it go. Let you know, it there go. is nothing wrong with somebody who's of, of pensioner age becoming a pensioner. T touring is hard. Music business is hard, especially know, if you don't like what you're doing or who you're doing it with. A lot of people in this world think that living the life of a touring musician is easy. Mm. and wonderful and great it is for eight people it is for bands like metallica who play a show a week and they get into a limo after the show and there's pizza in the limo waiting for them it is cold but it's pizza so it might not even be might even be warm they're metallica like, no yep. kirk said it's not warm it's never oh, okay warm. you can't get it warm i mean you would have to really nail that time frame they have and chefs they have their own chefs not on it's tour. like it's like go Metallica on tour is like going to a luxury spa right. and then touring also. Right. Also Obviously. playing a concert but having a masseuse and a chef and a right. personal trainer and a barber and, they, and a stylist and a And then they sightsee for five days. A valet. Yeah. And then they play a show, eat the pizza. You know, it's not that way for Slayer. Slayer plays a show in a three thousand seat theater, you know, makes there's probably about see 3000 seats. You know, they pull in about $100,000 for that show. And then they've got to pay for the crew, pay for all the business, pay for all the pay for the bus. You know, a bus gets 5 miles to the gallon. So if you're driving from St. Louis to Chicago, which is 260 miles, you are going on 40 40, I'm sorry, 52 gallons of gas at 5 bucks a gallon because it's diesel. So that's 200 and you know that is Jesus. That's a big number. I don't know. It, basically, you know, it's 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 a hotel stay. Then you gotta get a hotel for twenty people. And... I I heard it's like seven hundred to a thousand dollars a day for a tour bus right now. The How gas much? is going down. Gas is going down. Is that at, the, at the recent peak of gas prices for diesel, it was seven hundred a, a day minimum for a touring band in America. Okay. Yeah. So and then couple that with then getting hotels for the entire crew and you have two buses because you've got one for the crew one for the band and then you got to have the trailer of gear so you're looking at three thousand dollars a day just to drive you know it's it's not super lucrative it's not super easy i used to want a job where i traveled for my entire life my wife had one when way back when and when I told her, I'm so jealous of that, she would always look at me and say, no, don't be. It was awful. And then when I had it my last job, I would make four business trips a year of three to four days, and they were awful. Because now, all of a sudden, I'm in this city that I've never been to. I'm bored. I can't go anywhere. I don't have a car. So what am I doing? I'm sitting in the hotel bar drinking, watching people do karaoke. It's not that cool. It, and even though I'm in nice hotels, nice-ish anyway, it's still not my bed. It's not my house. You don't realize how comfortable your home life is until you have to go walk away from it. So, Tom or I, 40 years of Slayer, totally yeah. fine. Yeah, it's fine. Walk away. Let it go. Um, two other quick news items, and I do mean quick. Uh, since you are a big Gwar fan, the documentary This Is Gwar... Oh, yeah. Is getting its wide release as we record this today. So if you have Shudder, a channel related to AMC, or you get a free trial of Shudder, which you can get a code for at ghostcultmag.com. I know a guy Humble that's getting a free trial. <clears throat> there you go. You can see This Is Gore, the documentary. It is brutal. I've seen it. It is warts and all. It will break your heart if you love the band. and uh, But it is worth a watch. I do recommend it. I am very excited to see that. I also have never seen the television show that Brocky was on. And I wish I need to track that. Which time. one? He's always on a few. There was a show where he played Odorous on a show. Oh, Holliston. Yes, that's it. Yeah, I also never saw the show. I didn't have whatever channel it was on. Uh, if anybody listening or watching this podcast has uh, watched the Holliston show, go message, you know, drop us a comment. 
and let us know. And um, maybe, you know, maybe we can figure out a way to watch it, and there's a chaser. There's a good chaser. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll binge the whole series and then discuss it. Um, and then finally, because you, you know, you have to talk about the biggest band in the world. I don't mean the band with the M. I mean the other band, Slipknot, has announced their new album, dropped a new single and video, released a bunch of new masks for those guys. And I alluded to this before. Their pre-orders are like half sold out already in one day. Pre-orders of merch, pre-orders of vinyl, almost gone. They're going to release a couple of other variants along the way. Um, we were discussing this on an earlier episode about the lead time for album releases now Ooh. is truncated. I saw something today by James Shotwell of Holix where he was like, yo, we're in the TikTok age. Don't even do the traditional band marketing and plan and announce a record and leak out singles and videos. Just drop all your shit on streaming and then use TikTok to sell it. And I was like, I don't know that that still works for old metal guys. I think that's a thing for younger fans of pop and rap. But Yeah, and that was... I'm sorry, go ahead. I'll, I'll finish. No, you're right. Go ahead. Bring it. Uh, that was something uh, a co-worker of mine and I were discussing. It's the reason why rap and pop are so much, so far ahead in terms of popularity is because they have changed to a new system that's simpler and easier. Whereas rock and metal is like, no, we have a way, we have a system, and we're going to gatekeep it. So, But also, fuck gatekeepers. Exactly, I agree. So Slipknot, I'm excited. Like the first song. Uh, love the video. Not sure about some of their masks. But um, a Slipknot album is an event album now. They are the biggest band there is. They move the needle for everybody else with the exception of one other band. And uh, at least in our genre. So very exciting for that. I um, would be interested to do a series on Slipknot. I will confess to not being a fan. But... I also cannot name a song. I cannot. I saw them on Ozfest once or twice. You can't name a Slipknot song at all. No, I can't. Wow. I really can't. Not one. No, I know they did an album called Iowa. Okay. Uh, I saw them, and what's so, and I'm gonna out myself here as a dick. Um, and now I saw them in ninety. I believe ninety seven. I want. No, it was Probably ninety. Not. No, it was ninety-eight. It was ninety-eight. They were one of the opening opening bands on the second stage. Is this Ozfest? I think it's ninety-nine when they first dropped their debut. In fairness, I did go. Okay, I went ninety-seven through ninety-nine. So okay, As probably ninety-nine. And at that time, I'm a big big Kiss stan. I'm I'm I'm, I'm Kiss a wall now. I was Kiss Army Master Sergeant back then, and I remember thinking to myself masks being ridiculous anonymous how blase so i that just completely colored everything for me which is ridiculous because i'm wearing an ace fraley t-shirt t-shirt while i'm looking at them so probably should uh, i probably should give that a go i was i'd say this for me and my group of friends everybody jumped on the slipknot train based on like the videos and the visuals and the masks and the jumpsuits and the gimmick and not the music. No one could tell me one song, but they liked the video and they liked the band. Hey, wow, sounds like Kiss and Kiss fans. And I was like, well, I wanna check this album out first. And I remember not being blown away. I was like, this is good, but it also sounds like a lot of stuff I had already been listening to. And then Iowa came out and I liked Iowa. I was like, wow, I really love Iowa right away. And I was like, I get it now. This is a lot better. Let me go back. And then I really appreciated the debut album a little more. You know, so also like things I was listening to at the time the debut Slipknot record came out was The Gathering by Testament. Uh, you know, a whole different breed of bands. And, and so, I, sh and I, I love else... new metal. I love all the new metal. And to me, Slipknot is that band that kind of bridged new metal death metal and mo whatever became modern metal as we know it modern american metal before new wave of Ameri the new before, wave of american metal. before the new wave of american metal and because they're slipknot and because there's rapping and because they have djs and because they have sound guy they never got put in with lamb of god like they should have got put in with lamb of god and kill switch engage 
and hate breed and you know, all that remains and mm-hmm. shadows fall instead they got put in with corn and deftones which doesn't make a lot of sense because they're much heavier than both those bands as much as i love both those bands so i think slipknot has matured and grown quite a bit over the decades and you know they are they are a band that they lead they don't follow anyone so i i should also mention that when i did see them i was not in a mode for new music uh people might be surprised to learn that i had about a decade where i was not interested Mm. in in new bands it wasn't until 2011 where it really hit because i looked into the, the the cds in my car and i went holy shit all of these records are from 2011. Huh. Hmm. When is that ever going to happen again? And then things just changed for eventually things changed for me. So, and here I am now, 10 years on, talking about all kinds of music. So. There we go. So, that is it for me. I don't have anything else to blather on about. Um, unlike previous weeks where we were like avoiding the topic, I'm happy to talk about this Motley Crew record. Okay. If you don't have anything else, we can what? dive right in. He's got it handy. This record? Yeah. My wife wanted entertainment to point out. or death. I mean, theater of pain or uh, theatre gonna... of pain because they spelled it with the correct British T R E ending. Being in uh, the Midwest, we always called it the theater of pain. Theater, yes, lots uh, of theater. To quote Robert Downey Jr. in Iron Man Three, lots of theater. Uh, my wife would like to point out that this is her record. Mm. So when I t- we know when I was discussing my evening and I said we're going to be doing a podcast <clears> on <throat> theater of pain, she goes. You're doing my record? Does Keithy know that's my record? Mrs. Cameron, thank you for lending us your record to participate in part of this podcast. So, yes, this is my wife's record. It is a club edition, Columbia House, Theater of Pain. They do vinyl? I didn't know they did vinyl. They did, back in the day. Uh, She still has it. Hey, oh, pristine, nice label. Oh, yeah. Good shape. We listened to this about six years ago. Now, I guess it was, and... We're listening, and she looks at me, and she goes, wow, Vince Neil never could sing. So I'm trying to tell you, what was your feeling about this record when it came out? Because it was divisive. Uh, when it came out, I'm 10. No, I'm 9. Because this came out in 85. I'm 9 <clears throat> years old. But bef- let's, okay, let's discuss that. Then we'll move, let's, let's move back a little bit after that. Mm. Um, the first thing I heard off of it, of course, as everyone else was, smoking in the boys room and Mm. being a nine-year-old smoker because i grew up in a heavy smoking family jesus uh, i mean they didn't i mean they didn't know but i mean nobody could smell cigarettes on anybody in the 80s so i wonder what it's like for kids now when they try to smoke because nobody smokes so i mean it's miles away but that's besides the point uh i I like smoking in the boys room that song spoke to me as again as somebody who you know was on the down low at that time, making poor choices. Uh, it, listening to it now, it sounds exactly the same as it did then, And but I was not at the mode yet where I considered things like brand, modus operandi, or selloutism, or anything like that, so. I hear you. Um, yeah, I mean, I... I... You can't call a band that was always a sellout a sellout to me, but like... Well, you know, also true. They wanted to sell out, not that it happened by accident. They, you know, oh, it fell out, they got thrown a bag of money and then they sold out. It's like they were trying to sell out from day one. They bought in instead of selling out. One of the things that we didn't talk about is they have changed their look. Well, that's what I was going to go to exactly. Um... So I was, I'm a little older than you. I was 13 in 1985 in junior high school, my turbulent junior high school years, which was, if I put it on paper would sound like the movie The Outsiders or St. Elmo's Fire for real. Or Mine Fair would Felix sound Dale. like weird science without all the good parts. <clears throat> Word. Without Kelly LeBrock, God damn it. Without Kelly LeBrock. What do you the animals want to do? What do you maniacs want to do now? Um... um but let's let's. I was roll. a fan. I oh, just want to say I was a fan of Shout at the Devil. Certainly not my number one or number ten rock or heavy metal band. I consider Motley Crue heavy metal, up until Shout at the Devil, and did not consider them like Rad and other bands at this point, who are also out. I love Van Halen, who I thought straddled all the worlds. 
David Lee was technically still in the band till the end of 85. So, um, you know, to me, no one come, came before Van Halen. And in that era, in that, you know, kind of phase, uh, I was just getting into Metallica at this time heavily. I've been aware of them, but now I was really into them uh, when I discovered Ride the Lightning. And uh, full on at that point and other things, my Maiden, Priest, other bands, a lot of classic rock, rock and progressive rock in my young musical age and days. And so, yeah, to me, I was like, why, why did they get soft? Because to me, they got soft. And I, and I will talk about that when we get to the track in particular. Why? And why did they change their look? And they were very defensive. I don't know why there's so much reference. I didn't realize People Magazine covered Motley Crue so heavily yeah, in 1985. I read, a, I read a lot of that. And I'm like, wow, you guys. And then I thought about that. And it's just like 1996 Metallica. Oh, my God. They cut their hair. It was exactly like, why are they wearing lace instead of leather? Why did they dye their hair? Why are they wearing more makeup and not less and less scary, less scary makeup? But also, you know what it turns out? They had a huge platinum record, the record before this. That record was a huge seller. Four times Multi-platinum. Platinum. By the time this record comes out, that record is a huge hit record in rock. So that's why they were on the public sphere. That's True. why there was a lot of judgment. I can see that. Let's uh, let's roll back the clock a little bit. We need to talk about something that's important. And before going into that, I know this is beer metal swearing. However, uh, I am not going, one, I'm not going to be having 18 beers. Two, I'm not going to be drinking till three in the morning. Four, I'm not going on a beer run. When I am done for the evening, I'm going to go lay down in my bed. Do not drink and drive, kids. So let's start there. Now, so in December of 1984, there is a party at the Motley Crue Party House, which ends up in the death of Razzle from Hanoi Rocks. I am not a fan of Hanoi Rocks. I cannot name any of their songs. I don't know anything about them, which is completely immaterial because a young man's life was snuffed out due to poor choices and due to a need for more alcohol. So if you need help, if you are <clears throat> having problems, there are resources. There is, there's no I in team and there's one I in quit. And uh, those guys didn't know how to quit. And uh, apparently I also am not a huge, you know, master of knowledge when it comes to Hanoi Rocks. But if you ask around and you ask people in the know and you follow the people I followed on my path to becoming a journalist and a musicologist, they will say that American bands ripped off Hanoi Rocks badly. Um, and that's kind of like, that's a band that was copied a lot by other American bands. And, well, that, and they said a template, if you will the the stage was set for them and <clears throat> with them being close friends with motley crew motley crew coming off of a uh four times platinum record having a world tour a headlining world tour after one after on their second album most likely they would have toured with motley crew on the next run and most likely they would have exploded but that is immaterial compared to the fact that uh not only did razzle die but Vince Neil, in his, in this instance, also severely injured and destroyed the quality of life of two other people. So instead, and he was arrested for manslaughter. And I can remember the first time I, I saw this album, my cousins, as I have mentioned before, my musical mentors telling me about how he was arrested for killing someone. And at age nine, I didn't understand differences of manslaughter vehicular manslaughter and murder it was killing someone it's killing someone not no legal differences there and we thought wow is he gonna go to prison or is, is motley crew over well of course they weren't because money talks and bullshit walks and the way vince neal put it was he bought his way out and the way doc mcgee put it was as a young rock star he could afford to he could afford to pay back the victims 
far more out of prison than in it. Now, Vince Neal does plea out. He loses, he, he pleads. I'm not sure if it goes to civil trial or if he agrees to pay X, Y, Z and it stays out of the civil courts. I don't remember. Either way, in the, he agrees to pay the victims, the living victims, the victims' families, blah, 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 as a platinum selling rock star. So a lot of his earnings are deservedly taken away. And he now has to get sober and remain sober. Now the story gets dark. -er. Actually, we'll get to that later. So they go into the studio in April. Or I'm sorry, not April, January. January of 1985. Not only is Vince Neil dealing with the specter of his trial, Nikki Six is completely strung out on heroin. He has been a rock star for three years, and he is now addicted to heroin. And again, don't use heroin, uh, period. If you need narcotic painkillers, I get that. Just make sure you understand what you're, what you're playing with. Uh, personally, in the times I have been, in the rare times I have been diagnosed them, I have not taken them nearly as much as I was told to because I'm terrified of getting addicted. So you have... Uh, the specter of the trial, you have Nikki Six being basically immobilized. And now it's time to record a follow-up record. And supposedly, I don't know if this is true, but again, apparently they were also unhappy with Mick and thinking of firing him and replacing him with anybody who they could find. Yeah, that's so, a great plan. So the band is coming apart. Um, <clears throat> In three years. I mean, it's it's... Uh, do we want to briefly run down the set list for the Shout at the Devil tour? Sure, you go right ahead, buddy. I'm just going to run through it. Um, Shout at the, it goes, uh, Shout at the Devil, Bastard, Take Me to the Top, 10 Seconds to Love, Merry Go Round, Knock em Dead Kid, PC Your Action, Too Young to Fall in Love, God Bless the Children of the Beast, Red Hot, Drum Solo, Guitar Solo, Looks at Kill, Live Wire. It's like if you took all those songs out and you put in Kiss songs in the same pattern, it would be a Kiss set list. I guess that doesn't make sense, but you know what I mean. Yeah, I mean, it, except <clears> for <throat> the fact that the solos are like way at the end. Uh, had set had Setlist FM existed at that point in time, as soon as I heard that first solo going, <laughs> out the door. I'm sorry, I, I've gotten old. And, pretty rocking and, set list though for the time. Yeah, oh yeah, completely. Uh, they didn't play Too Fast for Love, though, which I'm kind of confused about. Uh, yeah. Um, too but, I mean, a, Young Me loved a nine-minute guitar solo. Old Me is like, shut up. Shut up. Don't play a drum solo. Fuck, drum solo. I mean, drum solos now make me angry. Tommy's a great drummer, though, and when he used to do drum solos, he really cared and put a lot of thought into them and... They were no, suspect wasn't yet a spectacle like it's about to be, but like it was a playing spectacle. He is a phenomenal musician. Like I know he's a jerk. He's kind of a, a schmucky guy, but he you know, he is fantastically talented. I don't know that he always uses it. You know, um, when it comes to <clears throat> Motley Crue, it's a lot like dealing with the uh, original members of Kiss. You are dealing with pretty four pretty scummy people, so you know, we're not we're not talking about angels here. We also have to discuss two other really crucial things about crew at this time, if I can intercede. Please do. Uh, Doc McGee comes in at this time, leading up to this record. This is when Doc comes in to and wrangle this, them. And he is at this time also managing Bon Jovi, if memory he serves. He is the early manager of Bon Jovi, pre-Slippery When Wet. He managed a few other bands. He had yet to manage Kiss. That's later. No, he didn't. Um, he did kiss for the reunion for yeah, and since ever since, which yeah. is you know good business, smart, very good business. And the other interesting thing that possibly leads to all these things swirling that makes this record interesting to me is so Tom Werman, who signed them to Electra, is now kind of their guardian overseer. Uh, custodian, him and Doc have to like clean up after the band, not just on tour or in their lives, but like Tom ends up because he 
you know, <clears throat> Tom started in A&R, and back in the day, and even now to a lesser extent, A&R people, which is a dying art, but A&R folks would get a producing credit on albums, even if they didn't technically twiddle knobs and sit in the studio. But Tom was from that era where he actually produced the records with the band, helped engineer the albums himself. So he is an A&R person that knew music well enough to come in and actually make an impact on the band. And he ends up producing their next bunch of records, including this one. And he goes on to, he is sort of, he was, he was like in-house at Capitol. That's where he got his start. He moves to Electra. He signs crew as one of the first things he ever does. He starts to kind of like, I want to also produce bands and I can make more money not being an A&R and just be a producer. Because back then, if you were had your name attached to hit records, you could command a lot of money for producing, which he did and produced every fucking body back then. But he also is like one of Crew's inner circle people. Maybe he's not their manager like Doc, but he's helping guide their career with his prey. He signed them so they felt beholden to him. He produced this record. So he's, so I don't want to say father figure, but he's guiding them. And I think it matters. And I think it's why this record came out the way it did. These swirling factors of Vince and the band and then, and then, and then, You know, there, yada, there's, yada, yada. there's no way you are going to get an accurate record from them at this point in time. An authentic. How about that? You're not okay. going to get an authentic because there's two of the, you know, there's four principles. Two of the principles have major, major issues that I hope no one listening to this ever has to go through. Yeah, yeah. If you've read the Heroin Diaries, it's about this period of this this record and the next one. It's like hard to believe this guy didn't die, uh, Nikki. And yeah. um, it's and hard to believe Vince didn't. It's, he's, it's hard yeah. to believe they're all alive. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, yeah, for sure. But like, yeah, Nikki in particular should not be alive. And uh, as the leader of this band during two of their most four crucial albums, um which has an imprint on how they sounded and wrote and recorded and toured because he was, you know, in, integral to their success to begin with, like him or not. Agreed. So. And, you know, l later on in life, they uh, complained about the man. And he's like, you know, hey, you, when you're producing their platinum sellers, they love you. But then all of a sudden, everything they did wrong is your fault. Right, Nikki has said this record is rubbish. Vince was like, I, ha I was in hell, I hate this thing. Uh, you know, Tom's loves this record because Home Sweet Home is on it. Mick, no comment as usual, but yeah, they... Uh, well, I mean, I mean, does anybody care what Mick Mars has to I, say? I mean, you should kind of care what Mick Mars has to say, but... I don't know. think Mick Mars cares what Mick Mars has to say. At least he acts like he doesn't care. Um, maybe, maybe he's crying at home, I don't know. I hope not. I hope he's not. Uh, well, he's not at home right now. He's on tour. So. Shall we do? Shall we do the track by track? We shall, and then if you after the track by track, let's take a pause. Mm. So, and then we'll discuss the tour. And then we'll call it a day. Fair enough. So I will lead the track by track by reading <clears throat> off of the back. All right then. Uh, starts off with City Boy Blues. Which is probably the weakest song on the record. That's fair. I agree. It's it's just dumb. It's it's like Knock 'em Dead Kid. It's the it's only dumb. song written by the whole band, by the way. Yeah, you know what? If uh, look, Metallica has it right, man. They got two dudes and two other dudes that like offer flowers and icing for the cake. But they got two dudes that bake the cake. Molly Cruz got a dude that bakes cake. And three dudes that make some flowers. So all of a sudden they're all in there and you get City Boy Blues. Um, Sonically. It sounds great. It sounds good. It sounds like a rock song. The sound of the record is all fully formed here. It oh, does yeah. sound like a professionally real recorded album, which they really... You can you can argue maybe really even last record that was awesome is not great well recorded so sorry whoever and uh, you hear the sheen on this album that shows you this is a different kind this band is in a different place than the last record. This sounds like a major label band. Mm. 
It does remind me of that first quiet run, first couple of uh, major quiet riot records we did. It sounds a lot like that. You know, it really does. Gated drums, a little pop sheen, very clean, not heavy guitars, heavy riffs, but not heavy guitars. Single tracks of guitar, no dub, very little double tracking. A lot of vocal, yes, a lot of stuff on that guy. Yeah, that's wild. That picture is wild. I have never looked at it until just right now. That's just uh, wild. It's like, look, at... we're changing, changing. It's like uh, Russian nesting dolls, except hor going horribly wrong. <laughs> and the this... last one. Oh, shit. Why is Vince by himself in the black? Because he was clearly shot separately from them, because probably after the accident. Uh, okay, uh, and composited into a photo image. That is not a... Okay, looking at the back cover, go ahead and Google... You know what? Never mind. Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. Anywho. But yeah. Okay, track. It's not great. It's definitely the weakest song of the town. Yeah. I mean, side one, apart from that track, is a really strong side. It, yeah. One of their best. It might be the strongest side we have ha heard so far. Definitely. But I mean, in fairness, neither one of us really much care for Too Fast for Love anymore. No. Uh, so we move on to Fight for Your Rights. See, what's funny is the track listing here on YouTube has Smoking in the Boys Room next, but again, hang I Hang on, know. this is, hang on, hang on, hang on. This is not the right track listing. Oh. It's one of those where it's got the highlights. I see. Yes, next is Smoking in the Boys Room, which is a great, you know, I probably should, as a metal <clears throat> guy who's so scary and, you know, whatnot, um, should probably hate this tune cannot it is so fun it is so well done and it act the video for this song is stupid it is uh but it was kind of great it had michael berryman from the hills it's, have eyes it's it's great because it's so bad it's so ugly it's cute kind of like me and except you know better they had a dog who steals the homework Okay, right now, you know, this this band that two years ago was so terrifying and was the, the target of the PMRC and, you know, used as a focal point in the satanic panic, mind you. Is now the feel-good rock and roll band. Doing a video where a dog eats someone's homework. Yeah, they hated the song, apparently. Uh, it was Vince's idea to do it. Uh, it is a very good cover. Check out the story behind Brownsville Station. This is another one of those, like, the one-hit wonder band gets covered 10 years later, 12 years later, and has a huge hit. And they don't ever need to do anything ever again based on Motley Crue covering them. They are still around as a band with one original member, by the way. Very interesting band. Check them out. They. Ann, Ann Arbor. They. Interesting choice of words. Anyway. The band what? They. You know what? That is the actually Royal Bay. There, mm. <laughs> that is actually a great chaser topic. Uh, bands with one or less members. Yeah. But uh, moving on, smoking in the boys' room. Great track. Great video. It, it, it's it's fun. And what we should have learned from Motley Crue during Shout of the Devil, they're fun. They're not scary. They're fun. Moving on to Louder Than Hell. You know, I listened to this album three times today, and I don't remember that one. That's a good song. Um, it was a leftover from Shout of the Devil, apparently, that they left off the album. Cause yeah, it, just it, wasn't uh, it was re the, the Shout of the Devil version was re-released on a, uh, a 2012 edition, I believe, with the original lyrics and mm. business. The most notable thing about Louder Than Hell, beside the lyrics, is that Louder Than Hell is the title of a very good book on heavy metal. If you are trying to appreciate your heavy metal history john wiederhorn and katherine turman two of the best writers on music not just metal wrote a book called louder than hell the oral history of heavy metal i highly highly recommend it for your bookshelf can i tell a story about that you book? could you go right ahead so uh in 2012 my family went to 2013 2012 2013 my family went to bermuda it, my father-in-law needed a tax write-off so he took us to Bermuda as a uh, to for his for his business, and let me tell you, I hate tropical areas. I hate the beaches. I hate the ocean. 
but I want to live in Bermuda forever. It's that beautiful and that wonderful. And so we're on the beach in Bermuda. I hate the beach. I hate the ocean. I had never been in an ocean. I actually went underwater and went, oh, salt water. So I went back underwater to get water in my mouth to, to get the salt water out. I went, oh, oh shit, it's salty. So this is not going to work. So I got yelled at that night because I uh, spent most of the time on the beach reading that book while everybody else was making sandcastles and playing in the ocean. My wife was like, why weren't you with us? I'm like, somebody's got to watch the iPhones. So that's, and, and yes, amazing book. Also, Jonathan Davis comes across as the biggest cock knocker on the walk in that book. Okay. <laughs> Fun times. Fun times. Good font on that front cover of that book. Anyway. Amazing book. Amazing <clears throat> book. Next on the album. Home Sweet Home. Wrong. You, Whoa. You're really looking at the wrong thing. I'm not looking at the, I wasn't looking at the label. I'm sorry, keep your eye on the money. Yeah, which this is, one was, that's which is where the title comes from of the album. Uh, it also had the original title, Entertainment or Death. Entertainment or Death, which is hilariously played in uh, David Costabile, who you may know from Breaking Bad and Billions on cable TV, plays Doc McGee or a version of Doc McGee in the Dirt movie. And he's like, six, six. I got this awesome new tattoo of the new album cover. I'm so strong. I love you guys so much. Entertainment or death. He's like, yeah, dude, we changed the name to Theater of Pain. Sorry. He's like, oh, shit. <laughs> he in, he played, that was actually a Doug Thaler incident. Okay. Yeah, so Doug was I, written out of the dirt, so I can't, I don't know why. He was just fucking yeah. written out. Like he yeah, yeah. Basically, he played Doc Thaler. Uh, yeah, that's that they they I think they even acknowledged it in the movie with a little cutaway joke, right? Like, mm -hmm. oh, we Doug Thaler's a really good guy. We didn't show him any respect in this movie or book. Yes, and they cut away, and then they cut it back, and Doc McGee was there. Right, Doc is there, and Doug isn't. So tr tragic. Um, okay, keep your eye on the money. Solid rock and roll song, not mm -hmm. spectacular. Solid. Well, this this album is not metal it's mm. metallic but it's not metal hard rock it's it's not even metal in an 80s sense butt rock it is the birth of the butt rock of today please define butt rock so um i can't do it justice uh but there's a there's a youtuber who is like finn mckenty and I, yeah, he's really starting to grind my gears about a lot of things, but I have looked up to him. He's really smart at marketing and music marketing. That's what he really makes his money on. Um, but, uh, yeah, he has that thing, which is like, KS95, everything, and the rock. And it's like the butt rock is comes from that. And so, um, yeah, um... Butt Rock is your God Smack, Five Finger Death Punch, Hailstorm, even though they're really good, falls under Butt Rock. Any of these bands that are the Tap Out shirt, Walmart Army shirt wearing dudes and their ladies with a still wearing a Stonewash something in 2022, uh, Butt Rock. Rocklahoma lineup bands, except for Corn. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. Now can I say home sweet home? You go, yeah. Now you can. Now, now the piece the resistance. Now, the, basically, the they could have ended the record here, and it still would have been just as good. Uh, home sweet home. It this is a song that they realized how good it was later on in life when they re-released it, which was base, which they remixed it and put ninety one behind it. But I don't know if they actually did anything besides make a video. I think it's like the equivalent of Dream On, where it became bigger, like, years later. I would agree with that. Uh, also, they did that live album I don't think we're going to cover at all, but, like, there's, no, a we're not. there's a live album in there in the early 90s, late 80s. Or there, this, there is? The post-Dr. Feelgood. Well, they put out, like, live 
a live video VHS or something from the Feel Good tour. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And that Home Sweet Home video was played at Infinitum, but it was a hit song, like legitimately on radio. Oh, Home yeah. Sweet Home. You can't even believe that Tommy Lee co-wrote this song. It's so good, a song. Yeah, it, it's, it, it should be <clears> Even with that. Elmer Fudd on vocals over there. I mean, Vince Neil on vocals over there. You know, I'm a dreamer. Like him on vocals, like the worst Stevie Nicks ever, Bleeding Lamb fucking voice like at it's least an incredible did, song at least he didn't shovel up he did not ch- well i mean like his whole thing is like his whole thing is but like it's an incredible song it really it, is i don't know about you but when i saw tommy lee playing the piano i'm like no he did not yeah he can play man i know yeah, but man. i he, he actually did but i i yeah. thought to myself no he did not and if you like if you like nothing else matters and mama i'm coming home and this love by Pantera for part of it, and you know, chiller moments of Alice in Chains. This song is partially to blame. If you hate uh, it, that's why. If you love it, that's why. This, this is the success is, of this song. It is the spiritual successor <clears throat> to Changes. Yes, and fans of Motley Crue hated this song. Hated that they did this song. Hated it. Yeah, and Metallica fans hated that they did Fade to Black. They and... they did. They should have hated Escape. They should have hated Escape. <laughs> But anyway, great track, best song on here by far. Uh, maybe arguably top five Motley Crue song ever. Maybe I would not def- even argue. I would. I don't think it's arguable. I, I think it's it's definitively. I mean, this is a. It, it also ushers in the power ballad. It's, you know, there was a time when the power ballad <laughs> did not exist. Yeah. Peaceful, innocent, lovely times. And then all of a sudden, it happens. This may be the first one. Then, you know, you have Living on a Prayer, Wanted Dead or Alive. Every rose has its thorn. Every band had to have one. But there were already some ballads. Every other the song. The hair bands already it. had some ballads because we did the, the the Quiet Riot series. They had. They were not like not, exi- you know, Love Hurts was a thing already. So like the Nazareth, these are they were already power ballads, but like power ballad, end of side one, huge commercial successful hit song, softest catchiest song on the record. This was the template. This is why. This is why one is on side one of. <laughs> and yeah, just no, all. I'm like, gonna dis- I'm gonna disagree with that. They had already created a pattern. Their ballad was track four. Yeah, they did. Maybe. That was the right. third time, and then they did it again on the Black Album. Unforgiven. And then yeah. they did it again on Low. Every yeah, okay. Every Metallica record track four is a ballad. We will say a lot of terrible things about Motley Crue continuing to the end of this series. This is not one of them. This is a great not on song. side even one. Vince, even side Vince one, is great on this. Side one is just it's aside from City Boy Blues, which is not great. It's weak. It's not terrible. It's agreed. It's weak. It's not terrible. It sticks out. It's memorable. It's catchy. Which, once I flip this record, things yeah. change. Yeah, but it's not. It, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Let's Again, power through it. Let's do it that way. That would be kinder to ourselves this time. Gonna say one more time. I listened to this three times today. Today. Yeah. Today. And once on Tuesday. Okay. When I thought we were doing it on Tuesday. So, I mean, I have poured. You really have put more time into this than I have, for sure. I've put more time than it deserves, but I'm trying to do this for the people. <clears throat> so. Flip the record. If you're watching YouTube, you saw me actually flip the record. Because the, the, the track listing on the back is not the real track listing. Okay. So, this kicks off with Use It or Lose It. So on Wikipedia it says tonight we need a lover. You should that is, use, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You should I just apologize. use the Wikipedia version and not no, that was, anymore. That was my fault because they, they have the first song like above the hole by itself. So yes. Eight tonight, packaging. To, yeah. Tonight we need a lover. Okay, I don't remember this song. I remember a yeah. big blur of sight. Nondescript. These next batch of songs are just kind of gener- generic rock songs um this is we have the weaker hit, one of the five on this side we have hit the definition of filler side two 
It's all filler, no killer. That's true. Yeah, correct. Uh, so track two, <clears throat> now it's use it or lose it. Meh. Just a meh. bunch of meh. Save Our Souls. Better. Slightly better. A little better riff. Good riff. Good, decent lyrics back to kind of the religious religiosity that Nikki likes. The poke fun at religion and stuff. Uh, also heard in Louder Than Hell. Uh, so the, I say Save Our Souls is probably the best song on side two, and it's not not by a lot, but it is. There's no good. <laughs> I, I mean, just said I, there was. You look, I'm not you, <laughs> and no, you're not. We 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 have a Venn diagram where we hit seventy five percent of the world. We see it the same. Yeah, and then there's that whoa that's not overlapping. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, moving on to. Probably <clears throat> Motley Crue's worst title, apart from anything on Generation Swine. Mm. Raise your hands to rock. What the fuck? <laughs> Do they mean a fist? Like, raise a fist to rock would make sense. Raise your horns wasn't a thing yet, but raise your horns to rock would be Our, a cool title. Wait, so they're not saying throw hands at a rock? No, I think they're like, raise your hands to rock and do jazz hands. They did not think that through. No. And then, the Beastie Boys inspirational tune. I hope not. Fight for your rights. It's strange when this band tries to be political, like they're going to in a couple of more records when they run out of stuff to talk about babes and booze and drugs. Well, that was one of the things they talked about on this one is... They still talked about babes and sexy and violence, but less. Yeah, that's what makes it. Um, I'm just I'm looking like, at the you talk release about date. This was right before the PMRC, which I think they were already the target of. So maybe that's what that song is about. Um, It's okay. It's not terrible. It's okay. But it's not also not good. Yeah, I mean, side two is... Again, I listened to Side 2 three times today. It's 9.53. I've been home since 6.15. <laughs> Jesus. I don't remember Side 2. Yeah, well, it's nondescript. But, you know, luckily Side 1 has two classics and a couple other decent ones. Right. I mean, mostly, mostly things that one can remember. Here's a good question. There are, like, I see things here in the notes where, like, Mick Mars plays slide guitar and Nikki is playing eight-string basses and synthesizers. I hear none of it. I hear not one of those things. Maybe the maybe a slide guitar is on Smoking in the Boys' Room, right? Because that's part of the song. But, like, what in the shit? I don't hear. I'm sure there are some synths in there, but they're very mixed low for the 80s, you know? This no. is a radical change from the Robert Plant series. There's there's a lot of talk about things they do and what they actually do. Are they like the meme? What everyone thinks I do, what I really do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's probably about right. And I mean, you know, maybe they were just trying to say, "Oh, look at all these awesome things we did." There was, you know, what there was some slide guitar. I will say, I did hear that. Uh, Mick Mars should it should be mentioned was the MVP of this record. Mm. His playing was phenomenal. He is uh, he he's like David Gilmore. He's like Ace Frehley. He's he is not a writer per se, but he is somebody that is going to take the the thing you have done and make it way better. Yeah. Fair. Let's let's talk about one last thing that I have, and then we can probably pause for the second reconnoiter about the tour after this. and then quickly I'm already go. ready, actually. He's ready to go, no pause. What I'm going to say is there was a citation on this account here that this is the album that turned rock and heavy metal into a singles format. I would argue that that was Van Halen 1984 with its six singles. However, you can't underestimate how big Smoke Into the Boys Room was on MTV for a band that was not really on MTV yet, and how huge a hit song, Home Sweet Home, and how lasting that song is. So, in that regard, other than Come On, Feel the Noise, We're Not Gonna Take It and Jump, there is no 
Def Leppard is still a couple of years away from Hysteria. Like, that whole generation of bands, Rat, Round and Round is a peer of this album. They're not really that many. You can count them on two hands how many hit songs are from glam rock and 80s hard rock bands. What, and what are we calling two of hits? Them. In the collective consciousness of rock and popular popular popularity, like mass popularity. You're talking hits or canon? I mean, that's... Both? In this case, both. Okay. Well, in terms of in songs in the canon, Def Leppard probably has four. <clears throat> rock of Minimum. Ages is the only one I can think of that was really well known. But yeah. Uh, rock of Ages. Photograph. Uh, bring it on the harp. Nah, They're a bigger that. band in Europe still at this point than America, though. I'm gonna take "Bring It On the Heartbreak" back. I like that song now, but yeah, I love that song. But I think that was a hit. In on through the night is my favorite Def Leppard record still to this day. Believe what? it or not, I love I love Hysteria, but yeah, on through the night. Anyway, okay, you okay. riffs, my friend riffs. I know. I'm, what? I, just, I, I, I my right, God is riffs. Let's stop. Um, One Dead or Alive. Not out yet. Not out by a year. Not I'm out just, yet. Oh, oh, wait, are we only... Okay, I thought we were talking 85, about the 85, June of 85. Like, I'm I just talking about we... up to this point. Oh, up to this point. Up okay. to the point the singles of this record came out. So before the record came out, Smoking in the Boys Room was already out. So, like, they had... Yeah, like, they, there are no... You know, there's very few. Less than you think there is. So, so we're talking about the, the, the rock, and pop, uh, rock and pop canon up to May this of album. 85. Yeah, May of to G, yeah, May of June of eighty five. Yeah, I mean, okay. like it's not that bad. It's not as big as you think it is. Yeah, Rock of Ages definitely. Um, bang your head, bang your head was a huge hit. Uh, I think at this point in time, uh, Quiet Riot is considered a has been. I mean the the eighties were a different time. It wasn't. It, it was very much top forty driven. Hmm. Yeah, Th I this mean, album I is at least quadruple platinum. That's freaking crazy it was quadruple platinum 25 years ago 27 years ago holy shit so it's at least a few more now and i think they have either just put out a remaster vinyl or they're about to i've got an og columbia house press it's you do good. yeah your wife does you don't ha ah. just for the record it's got a uh got a pentagram pentagram <laughs> and bloody tears some gangster shit there's some some Bloods and Crips shit right there. Yeah, they had no idea what they were the, the, the things they were even playing with. So I, that, that's the best part. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about the tour a little bit. Again, they were touring significantly. Um, the average set list looks like this: looks that kill, shout at the devil, use it or lose it, fight for your rights, piece of your action, ten seconds to love. Which all I can remember is the big chorus, which sounds terrible. Uh, home sweet home, red hot. Keep your eye on the money. Drum solo, louder than hell. Too young to fall in love. Knock 'em dead, kid. Live wire. Smoking in the boys' room. Helter skelter, and they close the so the set out with jailhouse rock. That is more than half the record live. Wow. Wow. Well, they only have three. No, but that's more than half of the new record live. I know, like but they only... six of the ten songs live. They only have... They played 18 songs... 17 tunes. And then they they only have... the voice room on there? I don't think so. Yeah, they did it. They, they did, did it. it. Yeah. So two covers. They only have three, three albums. I mean... We're not talking about an, a band with... Yeah... They have about they have less than thirty songs, so I guess you're right. I actually saw recently a conversation on the internet. You know, <clears throat> what are your top ten Motley tunes? And I'm like, I don't know that I can get to ten. <laughs> you got to stretch to ten. I think it's ten. It's ten. I mean, I, I can get to I ten. Can, we come up with ten. How about that? Would be a fun exercise for the last episode. We have to come up with ten. Ten from ten. what? The whole run. Oh, that's okay. I can do that. I the mean, whole run of... that we've done, not the records that oh. have yet to come out. Oh, okay. You just, you don't get uh, you don't get Generation Swine, my friend. You don't get it. No. Uh, the the Generation get, Swine, and you don't get the Hooligans Holiday. You don't get it. I love Hooligans Holiday. I do too. I would be in my top five Motley Crue songs if I could. so. Would Power to the Music? But, but that's why we, <laughs> we you don't get your druthers, and you have to really struggle for it. It's better. And 
out of these five records, <laughs> that's a better record than three of those five. But yeah, um, I yeah maybe maybe even maybe more. I don't know. Um, this is a good record. It's not a great record. The hit songs carry it. Home Sweet Home's an all time great song. I don't love smoking in the boys' room in general, but it I is do. a it is a great cover, and the video was amazing for the time. You know, I I don't know that Motley Crue has really made a great record to this point. It's you coming. know, and it it is coming. It's it, next week, um, but we're talking about a band on their third record. But let's talk about their contemporaries. So, on Def Leppard's third record. They bust out Pyromania and explode. Mm. On Twisted Sisters' third record, they come back with Stay Hungry. Stay Hungry, Stay Hungry's the third, isn't it? Um, yeah. Okay. Second or third. Then you have Mattel or Quiet Riot coming out with their third record, and holy shit. They screwed the pooch on that one. Did not buy a dinner. Uh, then you have Metallica coming out with their third record, which was Master of Puppets, an all-time classic. Uh, bon Jovi's third record, I believe, was Slippery. Pretty sure. Which uh, shoots them into the stratosphere. That was when I heard of the band, personally. Uh, so you know they're 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 trending in the right way. I would say each album, as a complete work, is better than the preceding. But I would also say that Shout at the Devil has much higher highs, and but much lower lows too. There's no real lows on Theater of Pain, and that's what. That, I, I think that that's their great success, which is terrible. There's no fuck it. terrible songs on here. Correct. As opposed to the first two records, which have several on each. Several, several. You could put several. a whole, you could put out a whole forty minute record of fuck awful songs from those first two. Yo, facts. Which, which is unfortunate. Super. Um. I don't know. I I don't know that I got a whole lot more to say about this album. It, I have uh, nothing else to say myself. I think it's good that we did it. It's you understand why it's still endearing to people. People's memory of this is another one of those where people's memory of this record is a lot better than the actual record. Is that fair to say, my friend? I, I'm I'm trying to come up with something witty, but <clears throat> you you've already taken all the wit and. Uh, that that is a spectacular statement of brevity, which neither of us are good at. the The first three Motley Crue records are definitely better than what we remember from the '80s, and we have deified and glorified these albums into something they are not. These are not great records. Uh, this one, the preceding, were decent records with moments of greatness. The first album is a steaming pile of fresh potential. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. I don't know if you planned that, but that was marvelous. No, I, di I did not. I did not. Uh, so we have a band that is building and building. Hopefully, fingers crossed, it all works out for them. We will and find have, out next week. I have nothing else. I will ask you to take us out this I, week. I will gladly take us out this week. Uh, thanks for bearing with me, and thanks for uh, one more of these, suffering through one more of these with me. If you are watching or listening <laughs> on you, wherever you podcast, to the Glacially Musical Podcast. Thank you so much for supporting us. Once cheers. again, please, cheers to you. Like and subscribe. Follow. Share with your friends. Drop us a comment. Drop us a mean comment. We don't care. Uh, you can also help keep the lights on by buying stuff from the link tree that is in some of our posts. And, uh, you I'm know, sorry. Help us I'll out. do better. 
help us out and uh, we may even use that money to buy some vinyls for the show because that would help and make sense as my lights are going out because the batteries are dying because we talk too long but thank you again for spending this time with nicholas and me and as we like to say at the end of these things this has been the glacially musical podcast it does not play in peoria however if you are in peoria and listening let us know <laughs>